So there's this guy named Abraham. And we read about him in the book of Genesis, the early portions of Genesis. And what we learn about Abraham is that God, the one true living God, appears before Abraham and calls him out of his father's household, away from the idolatry and the worship of false gods, and the one true living God calls Abraham to leave his father's household and to follow him. And so that's what Abraham does. He leaves his father's household and he follows the Lord. However, there's this legend, this story that arose that's kind of like a prequel to these events that um, these, these ancient rabbis used to tell. And this can be found in this work. It's called uh, Midrash Rabbah. And it's kind of this uh, fictitious tale, this legend of something that happened to Abraham in his early life. The story goes like this. Abraham was living in his father's household. His father's name was Terah. And this story suggests that his father owned a store that sold various idols and statues and altars to these false gods. And so this man sold them for a living. Well, story has it, one day, Terah had to leave. Had to leave the shop, go on errands, whatever he's doing. So he leaves his son, Abraham, in charge of the store for the day. So Abraham's behind the counter. And remember, Abraham has had an encounter with the one true living God, so he knows this is all just a crock with these idols and statues. So Abraham's working the front desk, and a man approaches. And the man inquires about buying an idol. And so Abraham says, Sir, how old are you? And he says, I'm 60 years young. And Abraham says, I think it's ridiculous that a man 60 years of age wants to bow down to a statue that's not even a day old. And so, talk about customer service, the man turns away and leaves. <laughs> Can you believe? So then this older woman approaches, and she has this bag of choice grain, and she brings it to Abraham, and she says, could you please give this to the gods? Thank you. And she leaves. So Abraham takes, I don't know why I made the old lady's voice like that. That was weird. <laughs> um, Abraham takes the bag of grain, and he goes, huh, I've got an idea for some shenanigans. So he goes in the back of the store where they keep all the idols and he puts the grain on the floor amongst all these statues and idols and then he's got a plan, a setup here. He takes a stick and he begins to dash all the idols to the floor and to destroy all the statues and to topple over all the altars and to break all the images. And then Abraham works his way around to the biggest, tallest idol and statue in the collection. I mean, this thing's like the Rolls Royce of idols, okay? This is the one you put on layaway. This is the one that you save up for in retirement, okay? Like the yacht of idols. This is a nice idol. It's the big one. And so Abraham's like, I got this. So he takes the smashing stick, and he's getting ready to follow through, and he's going to cut them down at the legs. Because if you didn't know this, us tall things, us tall people, always go for the legs, okay? We're top heavy. Always go for our legs. Now, don't use that against me, but just know that. So Abraham's going to strike his legs so it topples over, and then <gasps> he relents. And he has an idea. So he sees the bag of grain in the middle of the floor and all the smashed idols, and the one huge idol, and he takes the smashing stick and he puts it in the hands of the giant idol. And then he slinks away. <laughs> and he goes back to the front of the store. Well, some time later, Abraham's father comes home. And now I'm very much uh, making this a, a very English story. In the original language, it's much more poetic than this. But his father comes home, and he's like, hey, what's up, Pops? And he's like, eh, no. and, his, and his father goes back to the back of the store, and he goes, what? What? I'm ruined. All my idols are destroyed. No! And he freaks out. Abraham hears this and is like, oh, that's my cue. And so he goes to the back. And he looks at his dad and he says, what's up, Pop? What's wrong? And his father says, what happened here? I leave you in charge for one day. What happened? And so Abraham responds. And he says, well, isn't it obvious? To which the father has no reply. And Abraham says, clearly, as he points to the shattered statues and the bag of grain in the middle, clearly all of the gods wanted the choice grain, but this biggest one destroyed the rest. And they both look up 
and they see the giant statue with a giant smashing stick in his hand. And Abraham framed the giant statue. <gasps> Exhibit A. And so his father reacts to the ridiculousness of this. He says, what? That's impossible. These things can't move around and walk and talk. I made them with my hands like a day ago. They can't do anything. I made them. They're just things. To which Abraham says, oh, really? Then why do you bow down to them? Mic drop. And Abraham's father has nothing to say. Similarly, there's this guy named LeBron James. Where am I going with this? <laughs> Hang on, we'll get there. LeBron James was drafted by the Cleveland Cavaliers in 2003. And before he came into the league, there was this expectation, almost this Messiah-like, this messianic expectation surrounding him. And they called him things like the chosen one and the king. And they said things like, he will deliver to us a championship. And the people of Cleveland began to ascribe value and worth to LeBron James. And they started to find association and identification with this guy who was going to deliver a championship. Because see, the city had never won a championship in any sport, and they felt out of control and helpless. And so they finally had something they could kind of control. Like if we can keep LeBron happy and, and, and kind of make LeBron feel special, then we can get our championship. And so they forced all their hopes and dreams and expectations upon this man. Well, in 2007, LeBron James finally led the Cleveland Cavaliers to their first NBA Finals appearance. And the city rejoiced. And they were exuberant in their celebration. And there was these whispers again, these messianic expectations like, the chosen one, the king, has come to deliver to us a championship. And so Nike, who sponsors LeBron James wanted to capitalize on this momentum and this kind of thinking and ideology. So they came up with a slogan, a campaign, and they put a giant mural on a building in Cleveland. And the, the, the pitch for it was, we are all witnesses. And they play into this messianic language where they say we are witnesses. And they even depict LeBron in like a Christ-like crucifixion pose. Playing into this whole notion. And so in 2007, as the people saw this, they began to ascribe to a great meaning and value and worth. And they found association and identification with this image. And they're like, yes, this represents us. And they, they, put, they foisted their hopes and their dreams upon this image and thought, we can't bring a championship about. We're kind of hopeless and helpless, but we want to feel like we can bring something. We want a sense of control. So if we have this image, if we have our LeBron, then we'll be happy and we'll be fulfilled and we'll win a championship. Well, I don't know if you guys remember the 2007 NBA championship, but it was a rout. They got crushed by the Spurs. I don't think they won a game. And so the city of Cleveland's hopes were effectively dashed. And after three more years of frustration in the playoffs, not being able to get back to the finals, LeBron James, in an infamous interview, sat across from a reporter and said, I think I'm going to take my talents to South Beach, Florida. And he left to go play for the Miami Heat with a couple of superstars, and they ended up winning some championships. Well, the people of Cleveland felt scorned by this. They felt betrayed by this. And they felt like all the power and value and worth that they had ascribed to this thing and all their dreams and hopes, they were exploited for it, and they were disappointed, and they were betrayed. So as an act of protest, they began to throw things at this mural. They began to try to deface it. They began to try to tag it with graffiti. People would post pictures of it online and kind of manipulate the picture to make jokes at LeBron's expense. And this is kind of what it ended up looking like. Now we know now he ended up going back and then we finally won a championship. But this is back in the day. Now, what does this have to do? What do these two stories have to do with each other? Both of these are examples of what is known as iconoclasm. So we're going to learn this word today. I'm going to say it, you'll repeat. Iconoclasm. Okay, we'll try that again. Iconoclasm. Nicely done. What happens in iconoclasm is that people have this man-made object built by humans, and they ascribe worth and value and meaning to it, and they find association and identification with it, and they force their hopes and dreams and expectations upon this, 
as a means to control what seems uncontrollable. Or they, because they're vexed by the uncertainties of life, they're like, ooh, this thing will bring this thing about. And so we're giving it all this power. We see that in the story of Abraham's father, how they gave all this worth and value to these idols. And we see it in the story about LeBron James where they put it, they kind of foisted it upon the person of LeBron and especially that image of LeBron. But then, in iconoclasm, when that image, that thing, disappoints or betrays or doesn't follow through and doesn't work or give them the control or the happiness or satisfaction that they desire, the people, in an act of protest, try to take that control back and take that power back by destroying the image. And that's what Abraham did to the idols, and that's what the city of Cleveland did to that mural. Iconoclasm. Say iconoclasm. Now, when I learned about this, as a Christian, I saw it for what it really is. Idolatry. When we take something that is not God, it's just a God-made thing, and we, we build it up, Maybe it's something we even built, and we ascribe worth, value, meaning to it, and find an association and identification with it. And we put hopes and dreams upon it as a means of controlling our outcome because life seems variant and out of control and capricious. So we think if we have our idol, that gives me a sense of control. That's idolatry. And really, at the root of it is this need to control or feel like we have control over things, or we can manipulate our own reality or create our own world or have things our way, and that this thing, this will bring about my happiness and life to the fullest. And throughout time, humanity has been idol makers. Just keep doing it. And we see this in Scripture. So we're first going to go to Exodus 32. And the children of Israel have been liberated from their slavery and captivity in Egypt. And they're in the wilderness. And their leader, Moses, is up on a mountain. And he's, he's up there. Kind of, he's kind of up there for a while. He's up there for a long time. And he doesn't come down. And so the people get spooked. And they say, um, we have no leader and we have no direction. And uh, we're in the wilderness and we need a leader and we need direction. Uh, so given their background in Egypt where there was just a myriad of gods and idols, they thought, ooh, we'll build an idol. So they build a golden calf, and they build it up, and they ascribe to it meaning and value and worth, and they find association and identification with it. This is our, this is our golden calf. We love it. And they trust it, and they force their hopes and dreams of getting through the wilderness upon this. And then they effectively bow down to it. They knew this golden calf didn't, like, come from the heavens and descend. They knew it was just something they made. But they felt like it gave them a sense of control in a time of uncertainty. Because idolatry is always about control. So Moses eventually comes off the mountain, looks at this idol, and says, oh, heaven, no. And he takes something and he destroys it. And then we see once again the idol is destroyed and the idol once again failed to bring about happiness or life to the fullest. Later on in the Old Testament, Israel finally gets into the promised land. And while they're there, they have this reoccurring problem, famine and drought. And they don't have food and they don't have water. And they freak out and they say, we need food and we need water. Uh, and so they seek to, to do something about it. They, need, they feel terribly out of control, so they need something to help them feel like they have control. So they're like, ooh, we know. Under the influence of some local tribal groups, they begin to worship this false Canaanite god known as Baal. And Baal, I've preached on this before, was believed to be the god of the thunderstorm, the god of lightning. He sent, the, and he, more importantly, Baal sent the rain. So if a storm is brewing, you're like, ooh, Baal's on the move. And they believed he would send the rain, which in this agrarian society would cause the crops to grow and cause the lakes to fill. And they needed this to sustain their economy and their survival. So if things were good with Baal, then our economy's good and we can survive. So they would build these altars, and they would build these images to Baal. We got a picture of one that they dug up. And so they would build these things, and they would describe value and worth and meaning to them. And they would find identification and association with them. They're like, yes, Baal is our God. He provides for us. 
And then they effectively bow down to these images and bow down to these altars. But again, it all started with a problem of not having something and feeling out of control. So uh, uh, we have to build something so we feel like we have a sense of control. So we're going we're gonna to kind of build up this image of this false god and build statues and idols to it and altars. That gives us our sense of control, and we bow down to it. It's all about control. They think they're going to control the situation. But as you see throughout the text, this never happens. In fact, I've preached on this before. This prophet, Elijah, comes before the people and he's like, oh my gosh, are you guys at it again? This is ridiculous. And he demonstrates to them who the one true living God is. Yahweh, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And he puts Baal to shame and shows that only God, the one true living God, provides what the people need. And so, like Moses... Elijah destroys the prophets of Baal, the statues and the idols, and even topples down the altars of Baal. And once again, the idols fail. Now, we hear stories like this and we're like, well, I mean, we're not doing that today. And like, these people were dumb. Like, that's caveman stuff. We're not really into that anymore. We don't really do that whole idols thing anymore. Mm. Which, I would question that. I would suggest that we still very much build idols today. I'll give you some examples. These aren't exhaustive, but maybe some of these will resonate with you. One that I see perpetually is money and the means of getting money. Jobs. And we've all been in those places in life when we don't have a lot of money. And it's very stressful and we feel out of control. And so we never want to go back to that place. So we need money and we need a good job. So we begin to build up in our minds and our hearts the importance of having a great job and the importance of having a lot of money. And a lot of our time and effort and our devotion and our affection goes into money and and having a great job. And then sometimes we begin, even if ever so subtly, to bow down to these things. And other things kind of take lesser priority. And everything becomes under submission to job and money. And kind of family time and relationships get left behind. And maybe church things and community things get left behind. And it's all for the sake of the job and for money. And we bow to them. But again, this is all about control. We're afraid of feeling out of control. We're afraid that we're not going to have something. So as a means of control, we're like, no, 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 no. I'm going to have control. I'm going to have money and a great job. That will give me control over my own universe. I mean, yeah, to an extent, but, I mean, how much money is enough money, really? And while you might be all set financially, life is bigger than just money, and there's plenty of other things that can go wrong. And so you only, you only have so much control, really. And this idol will fail you eventually. It's just going to be like chasing your tail. Similarly, I see people set up these idols of possessions, material possessions. And people look around and they're like, oh my gosh, they have that? What? A new iPhone? What? What a nice house. And they feel like, I don't have any of those things. So they see something like, I don't have this, I need this, and like, I want to feel like I can relate and associate with these people, so I need to have these things too. So then they begin to build up in their mind how, how important possessions are. And they, they commit so much thought and so much emotional energy and so much affection towards possessions. And then sometimes we even begin to build them up literally and physically. And we build these big, fancy, expensive houses. But then the problem is you have to fill it with big, fancy, expensive furniture, and then you have to have big, fancy, expensive insurance for it, and then you have to have big, fancy, expensive, like, lawn care and, and things like that. So it all, like, looks good together. And when you just kind of keep digging, and it's more and more and more. Now, these things are not inherently bad at all. In fact, they're good. But with idolatry, what happens is a good thing becomes a God thing. And I see people start to prioritize this too much and build up too much. And I see people ever so subtly start to kind of bow down to these things. And I've seen it several times. I've helped some people move houses to where, like, everything was saran wrapped. I'd be like, why did you saran wrap a light bulb? Or, like, you saran wrapped a futon. I'm pretty sure the way you're supposed to move these is just rolling them down the stairs. Why did you saran wrap it? It's a futon, bro. 
And some people, they, it's so stressful moving them and everything's wrapped up so much because the, their stuff is so important that I'm like, are we at a U-Haul or like the uh, loading deck of Ashley's furniture? Because I don't know, I'm not sure what's going on here. And there's so much importance placed on stuff. Similarly, I've been to some people's houses where like, I'll go up to a t- kitchen table and they'll be like, no, 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 no. That's not the eating at table. That's the looking at pretty table. And I'm like, well, um, I had no idea. Sorry. And then I go to sit down and like, no, 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 no. That's not the sitting on couch. That's the nice pretty couch that we look at. That's the sitting down couch. And I'm like, you know, I'm going to just stand. Like, I'm going to just stand. I'm good. And there's some people who I found that they're so persnickety about their things or they seem so enslaved by their things that when I go to their house, I just wish I had one of those like big plastic bubbles, like a hamster wheel. I could just like wheel around and like not contaminate anything it with or anything in. And I see people bow down to these possessions and it's almost as if their possessions possess them. And a lot of it, I'm telling you, is this control. The world outside the four walls of my house is crazy and out of control and uncertain. So what I need to do is erect these walls and fill it with nice things and kind of be God of my own world while I'm in here. And I can control that. And again, some of that's okay, but if it gets out of control, it becomes idolatry. And that idol will fail you. Listen, I've been in a lot of nursing homes to do ministry, and never once have I seen big, ornate, elaborate things like this. I mean, you can't take it with you. Unless you pull like a pyramids at Giza kind of scheme, you're not going to be buried with your possessions. They're not lasting, and they will not bring about the happiness or the fulfillment that you're seeking from them. Lastly, I see people tend to idolize their image. I'm not even talking about maybe like makeup and clothes and things like that. I would say that's more like possessions. But I'm saying their image in terms of what people think about them. And a lot of times we look around and we're like, oh, their life is so great. Ooh, I want their life. My life is terrible. And so they see, they, they kind of see this imbalance here. And so what they, they want to do is like, ooh, my life needs to be better and it needs to look better and it needs to look cooler. So I have a knee here. So what I can do is I can build something. And we build these social media profiles. Be it on Facebook, which I still love, which I'm told is antiquated. I still love Facebook. Instagram or Whatever the kids are doing, snappy chats, whatever it is, not real sure. Bunch of obtuse face swaps, I don't know what's going on there. Um, I'm kind of behind on the times. I like when my grandma will call me and be like, I'm on MySpace. I'm like, Grandma, nobody does MySpace anymore. <laughs> Come on. Anyway, so we build these social media profiles. And we ascribe much value and worth to them. And we find identification and association in our profiles. And, and we kind of place our hopes and dreams of what we want people to think about us on these. And then, after building them, we tend to constantly bow down to them. And people will be talking to us, and we bow down to them. And we'll be sitting at the dinner table, and we will bow down to them. And we'll be driving in crazy, busy Atlanta traffic, and we'll bow down to them. <laughs> Public service announcement. Don't do that. And so we see once again this building and bowing. And I think a lot of it is to have this sense of control that while I can't control what's going on from beginning to end in this big scary world, and I can't see things as God sees them, what I can control though is a little four by four box, and this is my world, and I am God of this world. And I see people like strain and struggle and stress to make sure everything looks perfect and beautiful. But the thing is, that idol's gonna fail too. You still don't know what people think about you. You probably never will. You can't know that. And it doesn't necessarily do anything to make your lives look better. I mean, I see pictures all the time on Facebook where it's like, you know, people with their like 700 kids and it's like, hashtag blessed, hashtag happy family, hashtag killing it. And then we only see that snapshot. We don't see the five minutes beforehand where it's like, uh, quit pulling your sister's hair, get your finger out of your nose, don't go to the bathroom there, take your pants off your head, put them back on your legs, and come down from there. Come down. No, that's high. Come down. Come back down from there. We don't see that beforehand. All we see is the like, hashtag blessed. And then we don't see the five minutes after where immediately the picture's done and the kids take off, whoa, in a thousand different directions, and the parents are like, wait up. <sighs> It's not going to do anything to make your life better necessarily. And again, it's not a bad, evil thing. 
we seem to be careful how we hold it and if it is becoming an idol. So the unfortunate reality is that we build idols and we keep, in some sense, bowing down to them. But they will always fail us and they will always frustrate us. So let me ask this question. What's the reason for all this? Why this need for control? Why all this frantic movement? Why all this idol building? Well, I would point to Genesis 3 to start with. Genesis 3, the story of Adam and Eve in the garden. Now, a common misconception here is that the serpent came up to them and was like, ooh, a shiny red apple. Looks kind of good. That wasn't really the draw or the appeal. They could eat fruit of any of the trees of the garden. Here's what the sales pitch was. He goes, the serpent goes, you guys know why you're not supposed to eat of the tree of knowing things, right? You like, you know, right? It's because God knows that the day you eat it, your eyes will be opened and that you will be like God and you will know as God knows. You will know good and evil. That's the sales pitch. That's what's in view here. He uses this word yada to know. And he says, you can know things like God knows things and then be like God. And so Adam and Eve who live in a world who perhaps they don't know what's going on from beginning to end. And there's a lot of things about the garden maybe they're unfamiliar with. They latch onto that and they're like, ooh, we want to be like God. And they eat the apple and that idol fails them and betrays them. Like they always do. Later on in Genesis, we see this account of the Tower of Babel. And all of humanity comes together, and it says in the text very clearly, they endeavor to make a name for themselves. They want to make themselves great. So they try to build this tower up to the heavens in an effort to be like God and to be able to step back and see things from beginning to end how God sees them. And so, again, it says they try to build it to the heavens. And I love God's response. I love what the author writes here. And a lot of scholars and commentators and rabbis point to the humor of this. It says that as they build this tower to the heavens so they can be like God, God looks down. Now, if they really built the tower to the heavens, God would be like, whoa, they did it. They're on my level now. Nicely done, guys. It says that God looks down and he goes, um, I think. Oh, yeah, I see it. Okay, there it is. And then he, Yarad, he goes down. He looks down and then he goes down to it. Yeah, to the heavens. Yeah, right. Yeah. And he comes down. Humanity didn't even get close. And God frustrates their efforts. And that idol fails. That man-made thing fails again. But again, the incentive there is to try to step back and be able to build a tower so high that they can see all things and know all things and be like God. Later on in the Old Testament, there's this book, Ecclesiastes. Anyone ever read Ecclesiastes? Anyone familiar? In Hebrew, the name for this book is Kohelet, which means teacher. And it's this, this guy, Solomon, King Solomon, at the very end of his life. And he's looking back, and he's, he's going to be our teacher in this. And, and it's wisdom literature, and he's giving us some wisdom, and he's looking back on his life. And let me tell you, Solomon lived a very extravagant life. He partied like a rock star. I mean, he lived big, and he did everything. But at the end of his life, he speaks this phrase. It's, it's written in, in uh, very poetic form in Hebrew. He says, Havel, Havel, Bakol, Havel. Meaningless, meaningless. Everything is meaningless. And he looks back at his life and he's like, What was the point? All the pleasures I pursued, nothing. They didn't really make me happy. All the things I had and idols and things I built. That didn't make me happy. And then why do people have to suffer? And like, why do people have to die? And he asks all these big questions. And then he realizes something. He says, the teacher says, Solomon says, I see the great burden that God has placed on humanity. God has made everything beautiful in its time. And I think we can all agree with that. Creation is good. And a lot of the things we talked about today are good things. But God has also, Solomon says, set eternity in the hearts of humanity. But we know there is something more out there. We just, there's something out there. And Solomon says, but we cannot, and it depends on what translation you have. Some say fathom, but the word here in Hebrew is matzah, find. We cannot find 
what God is doing from beginning to end. With our finite mind, we cannot know as God knows or be like God or find out what God's doing from the beginning to the end. And we can't see things as God sees things and know things as God knows th things. And this is our burden. And this vexes us. I mean, don't most of us here want to know what our lives are going to turn out to be like? Don't we want to know what the future is? This is the burden that God has placed on us. We can't find it and we don't know. So then, Solomon has this realization where it seems like he's at a really low moment. He has a realization. And I'll give you the more kind of wooden Hebrew translation here. I think it, it reads better and communicates better. He says, there is no good but to rejoice. And the word here in Hebrew for rejoice is samach. It can mean rejoice or be happy. He says, there is no good but to just be happy and rejoice. And to make good. And the word here um, is asa. And for make, and it can mean make or do. To make or do good things. To enjoy good food and good drink. And to see the good even in the bad. To see the good in our toil and our suffering. Let's review that. Solomon says, knowing the burden that God has placed on us and how we want to know things, we want to be like God, we want to have that control, Solomon realizes that <sighs> there is no good but to just rejoice and be happy, to make good things and do good things, to enjoy good food and drink, and to see the good, intentionally see the good in the bad. And this, he says, ready for it? is a gift. It is the gift of God. And it's hard to receive things as a gift when we're clenched up tight all the time we want control and we're ah, stressed out. You got to open up your palm and receive it as a gift. Now in my life and times, I've seen two groups of people that excel at this. Similar to Solomon, people in the twilight years of their lives. And also, people who battle illness and infirmity. I, um, I've mentioned this before. I don't really like going into it too much, but um, I've battled an illness for about five or six years now, and it's found me in a lot of waiting rooms of clinics and hospitals, and by far, I'm always easily the youngest person there. And I went to a cardiologist appointment last week where it was just like, oh, okay, well, I'm the only person here under 60. That's good. And I've had a lot of really cool conversations with people, and when I talk to people in these waiting rooms, whether they're older or sick or both, they seem to just be so relaxed and accepting. And they don't seem to be just toiling and stressing out. There's this one time in particular that will just be seared into my memory. I had to go for the certain test I was having. It didn't have anything to do with cancer, but I had to go to a cancer center to get this test. And so I'm sitting in this chair, and I've got this needle in my arm, and this wire going up into my arm for this test. And it was like two hours long. And I'm surrounded by people getting different kinds of injections, infusions, and chemotherapy. And so if you like panned the camera out and you moved, you know, panned it from right to left, you'd see like older person nice and calm, older person nice and calm, older, older person nice and calm. And then this 24-year-old young man who's like furiously texting on his cell phone and like making an agenda and a plan and working on a sermon and like texting his friends back and checking the scores. Old person relaxed, old person relaxed, old person relaxed. And I just kind of started to learn from that and glean from that. And I'll never forget, there was this lady sitting in the left-hand corner who, again, she had a wire in her arm just like me, a needle in her arm just like me. And she just seemed to just kind of glow. She just seemed just bright. She seemed relaxed and happy and accepting. And she was just sitting there sewing or knitting something. I don't know the difference between sewing and knitting. I don't know. Do we have a professional opinion on this, maybe? <laughs> Knit knitting, okay. So she was knitting something. And she was just having calm, casual conversation with another woman. And I just was so inspired and so moved by that as a young man. And in hindsight, as I look at that now, in light of what I know now, I realized that that woman, smile on her face, was simply rejoicing and being happy in the day that she was given. She was continuing to make good and do good. And as she left that place, she was, whatever food she could handle or hold down, she was probably really going to enjoy that food and that drink. 
and savor it for the good gift that it is. And I could clearly tell by looking at her that she could see the good in the toil, and she could see that this whole thing she's still doing is a gift. And that will always stick with me. So maybe you hear that, and you think, yeah, that resonates with me. That, wow, that was perspective changing. Or maybe that doesn't help at all. And maybe you think to yourself, well, yeah, Matt, but those are people like later in life and older in life, and they've saved money for years, and they've had good jobs. And, and I mean, you even said it yourself, Solomon was filthy rich. Um, I'm not in a situation in, right now like that. Like, you're telling me, like, see the good in toil? I'm just going to be real with you, Matt. I can't see that right now. Like, I'm so stressed out. I'm so worried. I'm so fearful that I honestly, I can't see the good in anything right now. I'm just so frustrated. And, oh, food and drink? Oh, food and drink? That's great, Solomon. I don't know if I'm going to have food and drink, okay? I've been eating Top Ramen and sucking down VA juice for like a month now. I'm broke. Or maybe you have some kind of illness and you're like, no, food is the problem. I wish I could eat food and enjoy it. Or maybe you're here and you're like, oh, do good and make good. Um, I don't have the emotional energy for that right now. I'm too anxious. I'm too worried. I'm too stressed out. And, oh, do good things at my job. I hate my job. Or like, oh, okay, I don't even have a job right now. And you might be here and just think, Matt, sorry, not to be negative, but just keeping it 100, I cannot rejoice and be happy right now. I'm just not in that place. I'm just too frustrated. I'm too stressed out and I'm too worried. To which I would say, that's okay. I get that. I've been there. But here, I would like to turn to the words of Jesus. And in this way, what Jesus is going to say to this, he fulfills something written in the Old Testament and brings it to fullness and fruition. And Jesus in Matthew 6, part of the Sermon on the Mount, and it picks up actually this passage right after where Keith left off in his sermon last week. And Jesus says something very profound and very simple here. He says, do not worry. Some translations say, do not be anxious. And if you need to hear that today, really hear that. Do not worry. For life, don't worry about your life what you'll eat or drink. Don't worry about your body or your clothes or what you'll wear. For life is about more than food and the body is about more than clothes. So if you're in this place of frustration today, know that your life is about more than the things that you are worried about and stressed out about. There is much more beauty and purpose and value and meaning and gifts to your life than these things that you are worried about. Jesus uses this word here for do not worry. It's marim na'o. So everyone say marim na'o. That was pretty good. Let's try it one more time. Marim na'o. Very good. You guys just learned some Greek here today. And this comes from this root that means to divide. So when you're anxious or you're worried, it's saying you are divided. You have a divided mind. And so maybe you're going through life and you're like, yeah, 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 I trust that God will, like, give me good gifts. But really, like, he hasn't, and I need to, like, do it myself. And you're like, yeah, 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 like, I'm going to follow after God. I'm going to follow him. But it's like, but really, i got to watch out for my own agenda and do my own thing. And you live constantly divided. Yeah, yeah, I trust, but I really don't. And you feel conflicted and pulled in two opposite directions all the time. And as I'm saying this, some of you here might just think, oh my gosh, that's what my stomach feels like right now, or that's what my chest feels like right now. That pull and that tension, and we live in that. Do not worry. Do not be divided. And Jesus gives us an illustration that resonates with us. It's very poetic. He says, rather, look at the birds and consider the lilies of the field. Now, I love the imagery of this, the birds here. Because a bird, for a bird, flight is involuntary. A bird's not up there going, okay, okay I got to flap my wings. Okay, flap them again. Okay, flap them a third time. Okay, is my lift good? Am I going to sink? Am I going to fall? Okay, keep flapping, keep flapping. Watch out for airplane. Keep flapping. No. It's involuntary. They just fly. And it's beautiful to watch. They just do what God has intended and created them to do. They just live. They just fly. And then sometimes they use the windshield of my car as a public bathroom. But that's, sorry. It's like they're, they're gunning for me. I don't know. Anyway, 
And Jesus says, consider the lilies. They don't labor or toil or spin. But not even Solomon, who we talked about, and all his riches and glory was clothed quite as beautifully as these. They don't even have to try it. They just, they just grow. They're not like, how do I look? How do I, how does it look? They just grow and they just live. And then Jesus used this, uses this line of argumentation. There's, there's a fancy Greek word and a Latin word for it, but mm, I just call it the more than argument. Jesus says, if God provides for the birds and he watches out for the lilies, how much more will he provide for you? And he refers to God here as a father. He says, if he watches out for the birds and watches out for the lilies, how much more will your kind and generous heavenly father provide for you? And a lot of times in churches, we forget that God is our father. God is a loving, generous heavenly father who will provide for us. And Jesus ensures us of that here. And then Jesus goes on to ask a great question. He says, depending on what translation you have, he says, Something to the effect of, who of you by worrying can add a single day to your life? Now, we see the word day here in English, and it's not exactly the best interpretation. Uh, the word here in Greek is pehus, and it means a cubit. So, I need everyone here to hold up your right hand, okay? Hold up, or hold up your right arm. From the tip of your fingertip to your elbow, that's about a cubit. So, everyone hold that up. Let me see it. Looks like everyone's making a left-handed turn here. Okay, good. All right, that's about a cubit. This is the word Jesus uses. He says, who of you can add a cubit to your life? Now, the word for life here is actually lifespan. So imagine like a line or a journey. Jesus is saying you can't even add, it, it translates to about a foot and a half in our measurements. You can't even add a foot or a step and a half to your life by worrying. He shows us how ridiculous and how pointless worrying is. And I love that. He just kind of debunks it and defuses it. He's like, it doesn't even work. In my preparation for this sermon, I did some research. I know, right? Wow, I can do research. Okay. Um, and I found that 85 to 92%, depending on what study you're consulting, 85 to 92% of the things we worry about will never actually happen or come to fruition. Did you guys get that? Like, we could probably just go with a happy medium, a cool medium, and say 90% of what we worry about will never even come to pass. What? Who here knows what a stationary bike is? Like at the gym. The one that's nailed down or like the, the ones in the spin class that look like a pizza cutter on the back, you know? Okay, we know what a stationary bike is? Here's a little image for you, okay? A visualization. Worrying is like trying to win the Tour de France on a stationary bike, okay? It's like, this is absurd. Everyone that's passing me, what's going on? It's because you're on a stationary bike, bro. That's why. Worrying is pointless, and it won't get you anywhere. I was actually talking to someone this week, and I asked them, what do you worry about? Like, just tell me, tell me some things you worry about. And this person, in very simple yet profound wisdom, said, uh, I don't really worry. I mean, what's the point even? And I was like, dang, that's good. What's the point even? So don't worry, because it's not going to do anything. We need to quit giving it so much credence. It's like an idol. It usually fails. Now, I can't stand when some, someone tells me not to do something, like, do not worry. Okay, see you later. And you're like, whoa, 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 whoa. Well, you can't just tell me not to do something. Like, it'd be as if you went to a doctor, and the doctor was like, you need to lose some weight. So stop eating. Have a good one. You'd be like, What? Can you give me some other alternatives, like maybe some diet, maybe some exercise or something? One time in college, I had this really, <laughs> embarrassing, I had this really bad panic attack. And I wanted to make sure I wasn't having a heart attack or anything. So I went in, and the doctor was like, oh, you're okay, you're fine, you're good. Sir, you're just, you're just having a panic attack. Sir, I need you to not worry. I was like, how many years of med school did it take you to come up with that diagnosis? Like, Clearly, I need to not worry. He's like, sir, you just need to calm down. And I'm like, clearly, I need to do that. I don't know how. Otherwise, I wouldn't be here. I mean, not that the ambulance ride over wasn't fun, you know, and the guy DJing was great, all these and goodies, but I'm not excited about the bill. That's why I'm here. Can you tell me something to do? 
Jesus doesn't do here, that here, thank God. Jesus gives us something else to do. Kind of an antidote to worrying. And he says, seek first, rather than all this stuff, rather than seek all this stuff, seek first the kingdom of heaven and his righteousness and all this stuff you worry about will be added to you. Now the word here in Greek is zateo, and it can mean to, to pursue or seek, but it can also mean to crave or desire. And what I have found is the more you try to live in the kingdom of God, live in the way in which God created you to live, like the birds fly and the lilies grow, God has called us to love the Lord with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and to love our neighbors as ourselves, and to act Christ-like, and to bring God's rule and reign here on earth as it is in heaven. The more we do those things, I feel like we crave and desire less all the other things. It's like it changes our palate. And when we do this, notice it says that these things will be added to you. This isn't an active verb. It's not like you will then add these things to your life. No, no, no. He says these things passively will be added to you by the aforementioned loving Heavenly Father who provides for us. And I have found in my lifetime that the more I set my eyes on Christ, who Paul describes as the author and perfecter of our faith, the more I set my eyes on Christ and just seek to follow Christ, because sometimes we don't talk about following Christ enough. Yes, we believe in Jesus, and yes, we celebrate his grace, and we celebrate the gospel, amen, hallelujah, every single time, son, but you got to follow too. And the more I follow Christ, I find that like, oh, what do people think about me? Uh, I don't care what people think about me. I care what Jesus thinks about me. Uh, what about money? Uh, as long as I can pay rent, that's fine. Or like, ooh, possessions. Uh, yeah, it all burns in the end. That's fine. And the more I set my eyes on Christ, and the more I endeavor to follow, I feel like my priorities and my palate changes. And I don't really want to seek these things anymore. I want to seek to be Christ-like. So today I would encourage you to let go of that control and that worry and that idolatry and to accept things as a good gift don't worry about all that ancillary stuff. Just keep your eyes fixed on Christ and following Christ. And when you do this, I'll tell you, there is great freedom in this. And there is happiness and there is fullness of joy. And it says in Galatians that it is for freedom that Christ has set us free. And just like the birds of the air and the lilies of the field, Christ desires that we live free not shackled by the bondage and slavery of things we used to worry about or be obsessed with or idols we used to bow down to. Rather, we follow. So we're going to stand today and end by praying the serenity prayer. And that's how we've kind of rounded off every sermon thus far. So we're going to do that. I'm going to speak a word of benediction over you. And then we'll sing it out. So let's pray this prayer together. God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, courage to change the things I can, and wisdom to know the difference. Living one day at a time, enjoying one moment at a time, accepting the hardships as a pathway to peace. Taking, as he did, this sinful world as it is, not as I would have it, trusting that he will make all things right if I surrender to his will that I may be reasonably happy in this life and supremely happy with him forever in the next. Amen. So today, Hope Church, may you destroy your idols and may you let go of your worry and your control. And may you not seek to know things as God knows things or try to be like God, having the mind of God, knowing everything, but rather may you instead rejoice and do good and make good things in the world and enjoy the good gifts that God has blessed you with, even in your toil and in your suffering. And if you struggle with that, may you look to the birds and consider the lilies and know that all the more your Heavenly Father will provide for you. And as you do that and as you leave this place, may you seek first the kingdom of heaven and his righteousness, not all the things that you're stressed out about. And know that these things will be given to you and will, God will provide for you. So may you follow Jesus Christ and may you find your strength and may you find your hope and may you find your help in Christ alone and not in the idols that we build or the control we try to grab onto. Grace and peace to you, Hope Church.